So friends, friends, the last few months, maybe a couple of months, I've definitely been doing some kind of quirky sermons, science related, and this probably will be the last one, at least for this series. <laughs> but uh, t- the last couple months we talked about the power of God, his omnipotence. We talked about the knowledge of God and his omniscience. And we played around the idea with these, with these human ideas, these human measurements, these human scales uh, of the Kardashev scale. For instance, when he was measuring the advancement of a civilization based off of how much energy within their planet, their solar system, their galaxy that they were tapping into. Right? So we talked about that as far as power. Last week we talked about information mastery, which was one of Carl Sagan's ideas uh, about how much data, how many bits of data a civilization uh, has knowledge and capacity in, in holding at a given moment. Uh, and, and we talked about God's full knowledge, his information mastery, and his just absolute knowledge of all things that are true uh, and even the future things that have not yet happened and all possible things that that could happen which is kind of an unusual right and today instead of going really really big in the scale and size and scope of the universe we're actually going to get really really small and talk about micro dimensional mastery okay we're, we're going small today all right and so this was originally posited by john barrow uh, who was an english cosmologist theoretical physicist and mathematician and and he observed that as humans advanced uh, the more advanced they became the more capable they were at controlling and manipulating smaller and smaller scales of things that that's part of our as a species being able to interact with the world around us and be able to create new technologies, advancements in science and things like that. And so this was his scale. Here we go. So I'm going to read through all of them first. So the first one was the type one minus scale uh, as far as this micro dimensional mastery. And that society is capable of manipulating objects of the scale of themselves, building structures, mining, joining and breaking solids. Okay. So right. Crafting this table, putting cinder blocks together, that sort of thing, right? Some of us are very talented in that, right? Not necessarily me. Uh, type 2 minus was a civilization that's capable of manipulating genes and altering the development of living things, transplanting or replacing parts of themselves, uh, and even reading or engineering the genetic code, right? And so in the last 70 years or so, we as a society have become right more attuned with that uh, type three minus is capable of manipulating molecules and molecular bonds creating new materials all right so that's another thing that we as a species have been learning about uh, type four minus is one that is capable of manipulating individual atoms creating nanotechnologies at the atomic scale and creating possibly complex forms of artificial life that is something that we don't know how to do with an artificial life thing uh, type 5 minus is a society that is capable of manipulating the atomic nucleus, all right? So that's within the atom, just the nucleus is the protons and neutrons, right? And so they are capable of manipulating those things uh, and those that compose it. Type 6 minus goes within those uh, and is capable of manipulating the elementary particles of matter, that is quarks and leptons, uh, to create organized complexity among those elementary particles. And the last version of his scale he called Type Omega, in which it's a society that can literally manipulate space-time, right? That they can just change the way the universe and its laws behave. Okay, and so right now, as we stand as a civilization in 2022, humans are somewhere between Type 3 minus and Type 4 minus, according to this classification. All right, and I might even argue that in some ways, because we can, with brute force, knock out little protons in the nucleus, maybe we're a little bit further than that by some measurements. So how does this relate to God? All right, uh, one of the things that I want us to consider, and it's a verse that I, I'm very fond of, is in Romans chapter 1, where Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, talks about the fact that we can see evidence of God and some of his nature within the things that he's made. And so Romans 1.19, it says, For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived 
ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. And so they are without excuse. Okay, and so Paul claims that with human observation, we can see in the universe that God's made, right, in the heavens, the earth, and the sea, uh, evidence of the fact that this stuff didn't get here by accident, that, that some information, some knowledge of God, some of his attributes and characteristics can be seen in his creation. And now one of the things he said was this goes back since the beginning of creation, but I'm going to argue an, an extension of that, that as we have become more advanced and have been able to look more closely at the things God's made and into them and see the structure and the organization and the DNA and the nanomachines that he's filled us with, that even more so there is evidence of God's divine nature within his creation. All right, and so we haven't always been able to see that stuff since the beginning of creation. Much of it is only in the last hundred years, right? Some of it in our own lifetimes, but it's further evidence of God's divine nature within the things that he has made. And so what I'm going to do today, this is my plan, my goal. I'm watching the clock. I'm going to take that micro-dimensional mastery and we're going to look at instances in, in the scriptures and in human history in which that level has been mastered. All right, and so first was type one minus, being able to just manipulate objects of our own size, right? Bricks, wood, whatever, okay? And so humans have done this, right? Being able to do masonry and metalwork and mining and basic architecture, engineering, all of these things, we figured this out a long time back and we're still getting better and better at it with materials engineering. Now, in the life and ministry of Jesus, I want to point out that he was actually good at this, okay? Uh, in Mark 6, 3, uh, when his hometown was not happy with him, one of the things that they said was, is this, is not this, that is Jesus, the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. All right, and so one of the things they pointed out about Jesus was not only is his dad, Joseph, a carpenter, but Jesus himself is a carpenter. He, as God in the flesh, walking among us, dwelling among us, was able to build things out of wood. All right, so he had at least type one mastery, type one minus mastery. Let's keep going. Type two minus mastery, uh, right? Capable of manipulating genes, reading the genes, engineering, genetic code, transplanting, things like that. Now, as far as humans, right, since Watson and Crick, we've been, eluc we've elucidated the structure of the helix of the DNA, and one of them was a World War II code breaker, and that skill came in handy because who would have thought that life was full of code and information, and that happens to be the way that we have so much variation amongst us as a species and all life on this planet. Now, more recently uh, was the discovery of CRISPR, all right? CRISPR was first discovered in Archaea and later in bacteria uh, by Francesco Moica, uh, and he, he suggested that CRISPR served as part of a, a, a life, a, a creature uh, its immune system, to be able to like actually change and edit its own DNA. All right, and so, so we've then, since then, been able to use this little pair of scissors, essentially functions as scissors, to be able to cut out pieces of broken DNA in creatures or now in humans and intersplice new fixed functional DNA, right? And so that makes us pretty advanced as a species. I do want to point out, however, is that it's not as though we created that nanomachine, the ability to slice into the existing DNA and, and interject our own code. It was discovered, not invented, that it's part of God's creation within the life that he's made, and we're just happening to use the tools that he left lying around and realizing, wow, this stuff works pretty great, right? And obviously there's dangers of humans doing more and more bold things, with the tools that we have access to. All right, so CRISPR is this protein machine that wasn't invented by humans, it was discovered by them. And so I would suggest that that gives God the credit. And whether Jesus at some point, as we'll look through some of his miracles, whether he edited broken genes in individuals to get their bodies to be healed, I don't know, right? Some of this is gonna be speculation and you might have better ideas than me. It's going to be fun. All right, so, uh, so CRISPR, we'll put that in the God column for credit as far as God being able to do that and also him being the 
originator of, of all life on the planet. He wrote the code. He created these self-replicating organisms in which the seed is in themselves to make others of their own kind. We'll, we'll give God credit for that. Type 3 minus, capable of, man, of manipulating molecules. Here's an image. Uh, it says IBM. You can probably see the letters up there. Uh, this is from 30 years ago, 1990. Uh, atomic manipulation was first done by Don Eigler and Erhard Schweitzer, in which they arranged 35 xenon atoms using a scanning tunneling microscope to spell out IBM. And actually, that same company has since been able to make frame by frame a video, a little story called A Boy and His Atom, using the same little things acting almost as pixels. And so in the last 30 years, we as a species have been able to rearrange atoms in a variety of different ways. Another uh, discovery as far as the creation of materials is graphene, all right? In 2004, uh, Konstantin Novoselov, uh, I'm assuming I got that right, uh, from Manchester in the UK and Russia, right? These multiple scientists working together reported the existence of graphene, a two-dimensional material where it's basically taking carbon atoms instead of, uh, instead of a lattice or a structure that is like coal or diamond, uh, being able to literally make a one atom thick material, all right, in a, in a chicken wire tape, uh, type structure where it's so thin, it's just, it's one atom thick and it, it's incredibly strong. And we've been able to use this if we add it to things like concrete, it makes concrete 30% stronger. All right, in the last couple of years, there's been the discovery of, of manufacturing that at an even faster rate called flash graphene. And I've got a picture up here. And so this was, uh, it says, a new process introduced by the Rice University lab uh, of uh, chemist James Tor can turn bulk quantities of just about any carbon source into graphene flakes. And this process is called flash graphene, a technique in which they can convert coal, they can convert food, they can convert plastic in a flash into this graphene, this two-dimensional carbon material, okay? Uh, and as reported in Nature, flash graphene is made within 10 milliseconds by heating carbon to 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And the reason this is helpful is that uh, Tor says that uh, even as, as little as 0.1%, flash graphene being added to, say, concrete would lessen the world, the massive envir environmental impact of the creation of concrete uh, by th over a third. And concrete is actually 8% of human CO2 emissions on the planet. And so, so just like adding a sprinkle of this graphene into our concrete, we can use less concrete to make equally strong buildings and we could right, save a whole bunch of CO2 emissions in the process. Now, James Tor happens to be probably my favorite living scientist at this time. He is of Jewish descent, and while he was in college, he became a follower of Jesus. And, and he's got over 700 articles published in scientific journals, and uh, not only is he help, helped out in the creation and origination of this method of producing graphene, but he'll show up in a little bit as well. But first, how about Jesus? In his earthly ministry, did he ever create new materials uh, by rearranging atoms? I don't know, maybe, but here's one possibility. And uh, John chapter two, verse six, you're probably familiar with this one. Now there were six stone water jars uh, there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. And Jesus said to the servants at this wedding feast in Cana, you probably remember, right? Fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. And when the master of the feast tasted the water now become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But the, you have kept the good wine until now. And this was the first of his signs that Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory. And his disciples believed in him. And so in this moment, all right, this is the first time Jesus does a miracle, and we begin to see the purpose of these signs is to glorify God and to build belief and trust in Jesus. 
right? When the laws of physics act as God designed and originated, they serve as a background noise of which a miracle now becomes a signal against that background. And you can realize something different is going on here. Perhaps I should pay attention. And now when it comes to making wine, right, it typically takes months or years to produce wine. And the fermentation process is done by microorganisms that convert carbohydrates into alcohols and acids. And Jesus didn't do that. He didn't have that time, right? He did this in the time it took for the water to be scooped and brought to the master of the feast. It happened really quickly, okay? And, and Jesus didn't even start with grapes, Right? It's not as though he had a pile of grapes and he just hastened the fermentation process. No, he started with plain water, two H's and an O. And so I, I'm, I'm suggesting one of the possibilities is maybe he rearranged some of those H's and O's into the compounds that are found within wine. And I believe I've got a picture here uh, where some scientists have been for the last few decades trying to identify what are the things in wine that make it taste or have the texture or the, the reaction that it does to our human palate, okay? And so they've identified 35 different compounds so far, and you can see there's some H's and some O's there. And in a moment, we'll talk about the fact that there's, yes, also carbon and some other things, all right? And so scientists have identified that since the 1970s and 30s, right, there's a variety of these different chemicals found in wine that cause it to taste the way that it does. And because of advances in their analytical techniques, they've discovered even more during the 2000s. One researcher who's made the major contributions in this area is Thomas Hoffman, a food chemist at the Technical University of Munich. And uh, he dazzled the audience by describing his team's efforts to strip wine down to its key flavor components, the ones that humans taste when they sip it. And he says that no one knows for sure exactly how many compounds a glass of wine comprises, but it's definitely in the thousands. And so our human scientists have been able to identify 35, and it kind of gives you the flavor of wine. But I would imagine that Jesus was able to produce, right, all of those thousands of individual chemical compounds uh, in the wine that he made, and he did it instantly. He converted one material into a different material, at least by arranging some of the atoms, right? Because notice Jesus didn't just start with nothing, which he on, right, the days of creation in Genesis 1 did create out of nothing. Ex nihilo, it's called. This is in a moment when he started with water and turned it into something else. Okay, which is actually, by the way, God created in Genesis 1 and 2, two different ways. Sometimes he created out of nothing, and other times he created out of the things that he already made. For instance, humans being formed out of the dust of the earth. And so Jesus in his earthly ministry here does a miracle in which he takes some matter and turns it into something different, perhaps by rearranging some of the molecules. All right, how about this? Let's go another level smaller. Type 4 minus, capable of manipulating individual atoms and creating nanotechnologies at an atomic scale. All right, so uh, back in 2017 was a race, the first of its kind. Uh, I'm not a NASCAR fan myself, but this is one that I was interested in, uh, and it actually includes that scientist, James Tor again, because he's like into all the nanomachines and stuff in which multiple labs and nations competed to create nano cars that raced against each other on a very, very, very small racetrack, right? That you couldn't see. If you were in the audience, you couldn't see it. You would have to see a screen that was projecting what a, you know, electron microscope was recording in the moment. And so here are some of the nano, oh, that, that's their race. Yeah, that doesn't look that exciting. Uh, but go, you got it, go, 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 right? And then checkered flag and all that. But the next slide shows what some of these cars looked like. Where our scientists, 2017, they did another race again in 2020, uh, <coughs> where they've assembled some of these atoms and they've learned how to make little machines that react to the chemical environment around them to have actual motor happen, you know, uh, energy happen. It's converted from chemical energy into momentum and turning and things like that. And so our human scientists have done this thing in the last few years, creating these little nanomachines. 
but I want to suggest that God has already done more and much more advanced things than that from a long time back. Here's a slide in which we see some of the molecular machines in our cells. This is often referred to as the central dogma about life, about DNA makes RNA, makes protein, makes us. Uh, this is a video that I, or a slide that I put together a few years ago in a sermon using some of these animations of these molecular machines that, that uh, transcribe the DNA into RNA and then the ribosome that takes that code and makes all of the little protein nanomachines that do all the work inside of our cells. And there's thousands of kinds of these little machines inside of us, okay? And what's interesting is the proteins are also the things that make up the machines that do the work of reading the code to make the proteins. And you have a chicken and egg scenario, which is a little bit tricky. <coughs> and so God has already demonstrated in the things that he's made that he's able to control things and make nanomachines at this atomic scale to perform real and meaningful functions, okay? Now, let's look at his story about Jesus, however, on, during his earthly ministry. John chapter 9. Here we go. Uh, verse 1. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered them, It is not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be made manifest in him. Let's see, displayed in him. I was thinking of a different translation. He says, we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And then having said these things, check out what Jesus does. He spits in the mud, all right, made mud, uh, spits on the ground, makes mud with the saliva, and then he anoints the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. And so he went and washed and came back seeing. All right, and so in this moment, I, I don't know how Jesus ended up healing this man. All right, there's a, ver there's a lot of different ways that, that blindness can occur, right? Genetics or different diseases or accidents can happen, right? In which someone's eye is damaged. <clears throat> so I don't know which, which method was, was wrong here, because there's very few ways for things to function correctly and lots of different ways for them to break. And so Jesus identified the thing that was broken about this man's sight, and he healed it. And notice once again, he doesn't create out of nothing. He actually uses the same dirt that humans were made out of in the first place. He just makes some mud, plops maybe a new eyeball in there. I have no idea, right? But whether he's creating new proteins and nanomachines that this guy was, had a deficit of, or whether he was editing or changing the DNA, or using some of his own proteins found in his saliva. Whatever way it is, Jesus had not only the ability to recognize what was wrong with this man, which, right, diagnosing a problem is a problem, right? Even if you know how to fix things, you don't want to fix something that's already working, right? And, and he also then is able to restore this man's sight, which is incredible. So whether it was genetic, whether it was a disease, whether it was a deficit of particular protein or the cells that respond to light and transmit that signal to the brain, Jesus fixed it on the spot, all right? And, and actually, a couple of years ago, there was some scientists that were able to partially restore a man's sight who had been born, or not born blind, but blind for 40 years of his life. Okay, uh, here, I'll just read this quote. I don't have an article for it on the screen. It says, scientists for the first time have partially restored the vision of a man who had been blind for 40 years. They did it using algae proteins, uh, and it marks a major milestone in the treatment of genetic blindness. All right, and so, right, we as humans, we're starting to discover some of these things. We can identify broken genes. We're like, hey, I think I know how to fix that. I've seen the working ones. I've seen the broken ones. Let me just steal God's design and make this one work again, right? Just swapping out parts. Okay, and so it seems as though Jesus could do things like that, or whichever way that happened to be wrong, maybe it lands on a different scale of the micro-dimensional. Here's another instance. In Luke 7, <coughs> verse 11, soon afterwards, he went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a great crowd went with him. And as he drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. 
and a considerable crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. And then he came up and touched the bier, and the bearers stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. The dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. And this report about him spread through the whole of Judea and the surrounding country. All right, and so Jesus in this moment, he restores to life a man that was dead, all right, fully dead, right? Like as I said, there's very few ways, almost one way in which things can function properly as a machine as complex as we are. And there are trillions of ways for that machine to break down and fail. Okay, and so whatever Jesus did, he identified what was wrong or broken about this man, and he identified perhaps how this man had died, and, and even, even with, with that knowledge, right, like even we as a species through autopsy, we sometimes have a hard time figuring out how someone died, right? We're, we're only getting a little bit better at that now, and we're usually only good at identifying the common ways in which someone had stopped living, all right? But Jesus was able to do that. And consider this, even shortly after the time of an organism's death, all of the pieces, all of the material for that organism are still within that relative space, right? All of the things that previously just a day ago or a few days ago were functioning are still kind of there. And so Jesus maybe just had to kind of like reassemble the parts again. Right? Maybe he had to like just pop start the car. Maybe I, I don't know what he had to do, but he not only has authority over right, the organism, the life, the body, but he's also got authority over the spirit and soul. And so whether he brought back the spirit of this man, I don't know how he did it. But Jesus had the ability to demonstrate right, raising a man back from the dead. Right? He recognized what was wrong and he reassembled what needed fixing. And this man was back to life, whether it was at an org, like level of the organs or level of the, you know, proteins or level of the genes. I don't know. But Jesus knew and he did it. <laughs> and it's awesome. It's to glorify God. And we see that's how the crowd responded again. They recognized something different happened here. This isn't an everyday occurrence. This isn't a regular Tuesday, right? This is a miracle. And they recognized God must be at work in this moment. And so when Jesus would do things like this, it was to demonstrate, right, glory to God, glory to his own self and ministry, right, and point out that we should believe the things that he says. All right, here we go. Type 5 minus is capable of manipulating the atomic nucleus and engineering the nucleons that compose it. All right, and so never mind just the atom, like with all the things spinning around it, but now within the atom is the nucleus with the protons inside there, being able to edit that. And so uh, let's see, let's go with uh, Lord Rutherford here. And his group of scientists were the first persons to produce and detect artificial nuclear transmutations in 1919. He bombarded nitrogen and ended up being able to produce oxygen by knocking out some protons in the nitrogen. So he changed it. This is like the thing that alchemists have been wanting to do forever, turning lead to gold. He literally changed the element of the material he was working with by knocking out a proton, right? And so we've been able to do this sort of thing even more so since then. It's actually become commonplace. The example I'm going to use for this of Jesus's ministry is back with the water to wine example, because as I said, water has only got H's and O's, and within that wine, where it was actually also at least another element, which is carbon. Here's, here's a, a little graph, a chart of one of the many compounds found in wine. This is resveratrol, okay? Uh, and you can see that there's, right, C14 hanging out there. And so how could Jesus get carbon when all he had was H's and O's. I suppose he could have pulled it from the air around the vats of water, right? But it's also possible he just changed, literally, right, the, I guess it wouldn't be the H, it would have been the O, which has eight, uh, right? He could have knocked out some of those 
protons and changed those O's into C's if he wanted. He could do whatever he wants, right? This is speculation, I'm pointing out. You might have a better idea as to how he did it. This is just a possibility. But he turned water into wine, perhaps through transmutation, the changing of one element into another. Here we go, type six minus is capable of manipulating the most elementary particles, all right, quarks and leptons. Is there a moment in which Jesus did this? Because humans do not have the ability to do this. We, we don't know how to, how to do this, we can't. These are the things that make up the protons that are in the nucleus, that are in the atom, that all of these compounds are made out of, that all the nanomachines that are, are made out of, that all the cells are made out of, that all the organisms that are alive are made out of, okay? And so this is like small, 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 small scale. Here's a possibility. Matthew 14, 22. Here we go. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat by this time was a long way from the land, being beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it is a ghost. And they cried out in fear, right? But Jesus immediately spoke to them saying, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you out on the water. And he said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. He, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And the Lord, Jesus, immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. All right, and so in this moment, once again, the purpose of the miracle, the sign, is to bring people to the conclusion that Jesus is who he says he is. Now, as far as Jesus walking on water, there's a lot of different ways that that could happen, but one of the possibilities is maybe he manipulated the quarks and the leptons. These things, uh, right, Higgs boson and all that, Hadron Collider, these things that affect the mass of the particular molecule. Maybe he changed the amount of energy in them that would affect the density, which would affect his own buoyancy and, boing, you know, kind of popped him out on top of the water. I don't know. And it wasn't just him, it was Peter's body as well that was affected by this at least for a short time. And so I want to point out, it's not as though Jesus froze the water because the wind and the waves didn't stop until they got back in the boat. And so this is chaotic water that he's like walking on. And so maybe one of the ways he does that is by affecting these subatomic particles and changing the mass and therefore density and the buoyancy of him and Peter hanging out on the sea. I don't know, but Jesus has the authority to change these things and more. Let's see, type omega minus. Type omega minus is capable of manipulating the basic structure of space and time. Now, yes, obviously Jesus creating the heavens and the earth in six days, I think we can give him credit for that. But what about his earthly ministry? Here's one last miracle for us to look at. Matthew 14. But Jesus said, they need not go away, you give them something to eat. And they said to him, we, only, we have only five loaves here and two fish. And he said, bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. And then he broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples and the disciples gave them to the crowds and they all ate and were satisfied and they took up 12 baskets full of the broken pieces left over and those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children now this is a different kind of miracle than turning water into wine 
All right, water into wine, right? He was using a different thing and changing it into a new thing, which is complicated in its own right. But it doesn't actually say that he made more than six cisterns of wine. It's not like he started with six cisterns and ended up with 12 or 18 or 30 or whatever. It probably was the same quantity. I don't know, maybe the volume changes a little bit based on waters and wine's properties, right? But here, Jesus does something different. He starts with a, a, a seed, so to speak, of, of a gift, someone's loaves and fish, and then he produces more of that same thing in an instant for the crowd. And this defies the properties of our universe. Okay, this is the pro uh, conservation of mass says that matter cannot be created or destroyed. And in this moment, Jesus is taking bread and then somehow breaking it and getting like more and more bread out of that same piece of bread without reducing the amount of bread in the first piece. I don't know how he does that, right? But he's able to produce more and more matter out of a smaller piece of matter. Jesus has authority over the universe that he made. Here, let's see. Let's consider this. Let's go to Matthew 13, if you could, for me, David. This is a parable that Jesus gives about God using small things to do great work. He says this, he put another parable before them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. And so Jesus is telling us that the kingdom of heaven is like this thing that starts small and becomes grand. Okay, this thing that in your life, in my life, it starts small where we begin to place our, our trust and our belief in Jesus and the things that he says and it becomes the most significant thing in our lives. He then, uh, here's, I've got a picture of a mustard seed, by the way, which is its own self-replicating organism full of, right, nanomachines and cells and molecules and things like that. This is what he's talking about. He's talking about small things that have a massive impact in the world that he made. He then goes on to say another parable in verse 33. He told them that the kingdom of heaven is like leaven, that is yeast, that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. And so consider this, is that leaven, this yeast, it, to us just looks like powder practically, right? Like it's small, it's like sand. And this woman, she hides it, and yet over time it saturates all of the dough that she has made. You can't hide it, is the point. Right, it starts out small and then it has a massive work that it does. I've got a picture of a yeast cell here, by the way, and just so you can see, it's, it's complicated. It's got all of its own DNA, all of its own chromosomes, all of its own data saturated, all of its own machines and parts and different you know, organelles that God's placed in it. And Jesus is talking about this, right, 1600 years before people discover microorganisms. Right? Jesus is aware of how this is working, even though his audience is just like, oh yeah, you make bread rise, that's how it works. But he knew how it worked. And the point that Jesus is bringing here is that the kingdom of God coming into your life begins as a small work. It begins as a small work that is almost imperceptible at first, but it begins to become the most significant thing in your life. It saturates everything about you. That when we place our trust in Jesus, just a small seed of the word of God that is held on to and believed in our hearts will bear fruit 30, 60, and 100 fold. That God starts with the small and accomplishes the great. He is the one who is faithful in the little and is faithful in the much. Right? Our God is the one that has micro-dimensional mastery. All right? He is type omega minus and beyond because God also controls things that are beyond and outside our universe and space-time, which he has authority over. He can take small things and bring them together for a great purpose, whether adjusting the forces of the universe to allow life 
or bringing quarks together to form protons, to form atoms, to form compounds, to, f to form molecules and nanomachines, to form life, right? He brings all of these small things together for his glory as evidence of his divine nature, right? He allows life, right? He allows life to even come from something like a grapevine and fruit to come forth from it that is going to produce thousands of compounds and chemicals that when crushed and processed by microorganisms to make alcohols and acids to create flavors, thousands of chemical signatures that our own tongue and brain have been designed to process for the sake of enjoying the good world that God has made. God has micro-dimensional mastery. He takes small things and works them together for good purposes, for our good and for his glory, that we respond like the crowds to the miracles of Jesus to recognize there is something different about this man. He is the son of God. He is a prophet. God has surely come among us. We can recognize him as our savior and we can trust him with a, a small belief at first, trusting him for forgiveness and freedom from sin. And he transforms our lives to be fruit producing, to be glorifying to God, to bring others into his kingdom. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, Lord, that you are so wonderful. We are in awe of who you are, both on the massive scale of your power and your attention to detail. Lord, you noticed us, you saw us when we were yet unformed substance in our mother's womb. You paid attention to us when we were little, and you are with us to the end of the age. And we ask, Lord God, that you would just be at work through your people. The Lord, you would use us who are, are perhaps less significant, us who are not making necessarily a huge impact that go unnoticed by the world in so many cases. So Lord, let us be hidden in this world, hidden in our societies that we would be bearing fruit and eventually see your kingdom saturate the people in the communities around us, Lord God. We want to see you glorified for the good that you are doing in us and have always done in the world and the universe that you've made. We give you glory, we give you praise, and we are in awe of who you are. You are the master of all things. We humble ourselves before you. We draw near to you, and we thank you that you are drawing near to us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.